Please pray with me. Dear God, oh, I just, <laughs> I don't even have to ask you to come into this place. I know you're here. God, thank you so much for coming into this place and filling it with your presence this morning. God, I just ask that you calm our hearts and get us ready to hear your word. Lord, if I have anything worth saying, Lord, I need your help to, to convey it, to, to preach it, to teach it to these people. God, if I've written down anything, God, I just want you to open their hearts, open their ears to hear you. May the words of my mouth, meditations of all of our hearts, may that be acceptable. May that be a joy to your eyes. Because that's why we're doing this. We love you so much. Amen. Halford Lucock, in his work, Unfinished Business, tells a story about a little town in Maine called Flagstaff. Um, now, a long time ago, way back in like the 1940s, the residents of that community decided to build a huge hydroelectric dam. And as a result, they were going to end up flooding the entire town of Flagstaff in the... Um, in Maine's largest man-made lake. And they were going to flood this entire place. Um, and it was, it was a planned out thing, you know. It was a, a planned ahead of time, and the residents were given compensation, and they were relocated uh, before the waters came. But what's fascinating about this story is what happened to Flagstaff from the moment the flooding was announced to the moment the waters came, to the, the moment that everybody moved away. You see, all repairs in the entire town stopped overnight. Everybody stopped fixing everything. I mean, why, what's the use of painting a house if it's going to be covered in water in six months? I mean, why repair anything in the entire village if it's all going to be wiped out? And so week by week, the entire town fell apart. <laughs> week by week, the whole place just it came apart, it gone to sea, woe be gone, beraggled. And by the end, only six months later, it was truly a depressing sight. The entire town had been destroyed before it was destroyed. The explanation went like this. <coughs> they said, where there is no faith in the future, there is no power in the present. When you don't believe in a better tomorrow... We're going to give up today. Today is the start of a brand new sermon series for the month of December called Access. For the next four weeks, we're going to be looking at the picture and pieces of the Christmas story, all while asking the question, who is welcome? Who has access to Jesus? Who has the ability to come before God, to kneel before the baby in the manger or the king on the cross? Who does God want? Who is worthy? And we're going to talk about people who are unprepared, people who are misunderstood, the sick, the naked, the poor, the rich, the wealthy, the brilliant, the idiots, the criminals. And we're going to search the scriptures looking for an invitation for each of these types of people. And what I'm really excited to show you is that when God welcomes all these different types of people, he is welcoming a part of us. When God is welcoming, reaching out to those who are unprepared, God is reaching out to us in those moments when we are unprepared and things are stressful and things are a little bit hectic. When God reaches out to criminals or people who are misunderstood, he is reaching out to us in those moments in our lives when we are misunderstood. When God welcomes the broken of the world... It is a mirror invitation to the pieces of us that are broken. Who has access? Who are the VIPs in God's story? And so we get into our story, and it's in first, uh, the first chapter of Luke. And this story comes right before Jesus is born, and there's this priest named Zechariah. And <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Um, a priest named Zechariah, and he's married to a woman named Elizabeth. And it says in verse 7, but they had no children because Elizabeth was barren and, and both were getting on in years. Now, getting on in years, of course, is the politically correct way to say they're old, right? They're, they're starting to get to that age uh, where they really can't be having children. And they wanted children. It tells us that. It says that they were praying for children. They really wanted to have a family, but they're starting to get to that age where they're assuming God's answer is probably no. That's not going to happen for us. We're not going to be able to have children. And so it keeps going in verse 8, and it says, Once, when he was serving as a priest before God, and his section was on duty, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to enter into the sanctuary of the Lord and to offer incense. 
And we kind of need to back up a little bit to explain what's going on. You see, way back then, in this time period, in the temple, in Jerusalem, up front, there was a room. And it was a special room called the Holy of Holies. Now, this place was so sacred. It was so special that only one man was ever allowed to go back there. It was a high priest chosen at random by rolling dice. That was their tradition. Only one man was allowed back there. It was very exclusive, very intense. And there, actually, there were some who believed that if you went into that room at the wrong time, on the wrong day, or in the wrong way, maybe you would be struck dead by the presence of God. So there's the Old Testament belief in God left people terrified and afraid of God. This is how they understood God. And so the Holy of Holies was the place where God dwelled. That was like God's house. You know, that's God's special room. And they had this big curtain covering that room. And that's how people understood God. God. He was in the room, and his, that was his special place. That was his dwelling place. And there was this big curtain that kept humanity safe from the raw and awesome power of the Almighty. And that's, that was their religion. That was how they understood God, just to be afraid. And so that's what's going on here. Zechariah has been chosen to be the guy who goes into the Holy of Holies. Now, and so he goes in there. I don't know about you, but if I'm a priest and I'm going into the Holy of Holies, I'm going to be very careful, right? I mean, theoretically, if you mess up, you might even be struck dead, right? So I'm going to tiptoe and make sure I do everything perfectly and light the incense. I mean, this is a scary moment. And it says right there in verse 11, verse 11, it says, Then there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was terrified and fear overwhelmed him. Now, just imagine this for a second. You're in God's super secret little room, right? And everything has to go perfect or you're going to get in a lot of trouble. And then, bam, there's an angel that shows up. I'd be like, dude, what are you trying to do to me, right? I mean, honestly, if I was in the Holy of Holies and I saw an angel, I'd be like, oh, I'm dead, right? I died. That's what happened. I messed up. I'm dead. That's why I'm looking at an angel. But no, the angel looks at him and says, I have good news for you. I have good news. Your prayers have been heard. Your wife is going to get pregnant. You will have joy and gladness. And the, the angel starts going on for verse, like verse after verse, about how great this kid's going to be. In verse 16, he says, uh, he, he's talking about the son, he will turn many people, wait, he will turn many people of Israel to the Lord their God. With the spirit and power of Elijah, he will go before him and turn the hearts of parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So basically, this angel is telling Zechariah, your kid is going to be awesome. He's going to be John the Baptist, right? He's going to be a really big deal. What does Zechariah say? Verse 18. <laughs> Zechariah said to the angel, how will I know that this is so? For I am an old man and my wife is getting on in years. Right? Getting on in years, of course, is the politically correct way to say. It. He's saying his wife is old. Come on, man. <laughs> my wife is too old. The angel just said, your child is going to be amazing. Your child is going to take parents and make them care about their children again. He's going to take people who have made mistakes, and, and he's going to turn them to wisdom. He's going to get people ready for God. And all Zechariah can say is, yeah, but my wife is really old. <laughs> The angel says, this is an answer to your prayers. And he cannot wrap his head around it, which tells us something. It tells us that he never believed in that prayer. He was praying to God for a child, but he never believed that that was going to happen. He didn't believe it because he was so shocked and confused when it actually comes. He was not prepared for God to say yes. So then we get to my favorite part of the story, verse 19. The angel comes up with the best punishment. Right? So Zechariah says, how is this going to happen? My wife is really old. Verse 19, the angel replied, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. But now, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time, you will become mute, unable to speak until the day these things occur. So do you notice how the angel doesn't answer the question? Zechariah says, I'm really old. My wife is really old. How are you going to do this? And his response is, I'm Gabriel, fool. I'm Gabriel. Stand in the presence of God. Don't worry about how it's going to happen. God can do anything. Don't worry about that. You're completely missing the point. 
And so Zechariah becomes mute and he can't talk. And it says that he stumbles out of the Holy of Holies and he's like gesturing and waving his arms around and everybody's like, what is he doing? And he could not speak a word. And so <clears throat> we fast forward about 30 verses. And in the meantime, there's like this little scene where pregnant Elizabeth goes and visits pregnant Mary and they have this little pregnant party. But then we fast forward past all that and we get to verse 59 and we're back to Zechariah. Now, John the Baptist has just been born, and, and they're about to, to name the kid, right? Verse 59. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were gonna na- going to name him Zechariah after his father. But his mother said, no, he is to be called John. They said to her, none of your relatives has this name. Then they begin motioning to his father to find out what name he wanted to give him, and he asked for a writing tablet, and he wrote, his name is John, and all of them were amazed. Immediately, his mouth was opened, and his tongue was freed, and he began to speak, praising God. (coughs) So... First, Elizabeth names the baby, which is really kind of rare in this time period. In this world, men, the fathers, were usually the ones that named the babies, particularly the sons. So Elizabeth names the baby, which is rare. Then she goes with the name outside the family, which is even more rare. Um, and, and, so, and then Zechariah agrees. And only when he agrees with his wife is he able to speak again. Now, I'm just a simple pastor trying to figure out these words and explain it to you wonderful people. And so I could be wrong, but I think what we have here is a biblical precedent for husbands to shut up pregnancy and agree with their wife if they ever want to speak again. (laughs) No? I mean, right? (laughs) Now, a little side note, because I don't want you to miss it. There's, There's one really cool part to this story that I've never noticed before. The angel tells Zechariah, you're going to name the kid John. But then Zechariah is struck mute before he leaves the room. Think about this. He can't, there's no way he told Elizabeth what the name was. Elizabeth came up with the name John all by herself. So really what the angel said is, your wife's going to come up with the name and you're going to say yes. That's it. (laughs) Just kind of an interesting side note. All right, the good news this morning is, and in fact, the good news of the entire Christmas story is that God is coming. Back then, they had this separate room, the holy of holies, and God was in there, and we were out here separate and apart from one another. But with the birth, death, and resurrection of Jesus, there is no more holy of holies. God's not like hanging out back there or over there by that table. God is not in one place. God is everywhere. God is coming into this place. God is with us. The beauty of Christmas is that it's the beginning of hope, the beginning of the end of ripping down the veil and having nothing to separate humanity and God ever again. God is coming. The baby Jesus is coming. And he's handing out VIP tickets to all of humanity. God is coming. There is no more separation. There is no more holy of holies. The entire world is God's holy of holies now. The veil has been torn down. But what that really means, the reason that that's good news, is that with God comes hope. God is coming, which means that hope is coming. Zechariah, he was unprepared because he had no hope. He didn't believe that God would answer his prayer. He didn't believe that God would give him a child like he was asking. He didn't believe that God would help him. He was shocked and confused when God actually answered his prayer. So he was unprepared for the awesome that is the presence of God. And so what we find in the story of Zechariah is that preparation comes with hope. If you have no hope, you're not going to prepare. If you're not prepared, it probably means you don't have any hope. Let me see if I can show you what I mean. Years ago, back in the 70s and the early 80s, Parade Magazine covered a story of a man named Eugene Land. Have you ever heard this story? Um, They made fun of it in a TV show called The Office, but this is a real thing that actually happened. Eugene Land was a self-made millionaire, um, and he was invited to speak to a class of sixth graders one time. He came into the school, and the goal was to inspire these sixth graders. He said, you know, let's come in, and we'll meet with the kids and inspire these kids. There were like 60 kids in the room. One report said 59, one said 61. So basically, about 60 kids in the room. 
And he's trying to inspire these kids. And he looks at this room full of kids and he thinks, how can I inspire them? What could I say? Now, he was in a school in East Harlem, in a little tiny school on the side. And most of them, statistics said that in this area, most of them were going to drop out of school. The group of students was mostly black and Puerto Rican students in East Harlem. So he gets up in front of them and he's about to start talking. He looks at them and he realizes this isn't going to work. And so he rips up his notes in that moment and he he throws away his notes and he decides to just speak from the heart. And he really only said one sentence that matters. He said, look, if you can make it through high school, I will pay for your college. He made a pledge to 60 students. This happened back in the 80s, the late 70s and the 80s. And he said, I will pay for your college tuition for 60 students. Dropout rates in that area were incredibly high, but for the first time in their lives, those children had hope. One of the students is quoted in the magazine as saying, I had something to look forward to. I had something waiting for me. It was a golden feeling. Nearly 90% of that class graduated high school in a world where more than 50% normally drop out. If you have hope for a better tomorrow, it changes how you live today. Think about that town in Flagstaff that was flooded. When you have no hope for tomorrow, you have no action today. So now think about our lives. Are we unprepared to handle the problems of the world because we don't believe we can win? We don't believe we could actually make a difference. Are we giving up today because we have lost hope in a better tomorrow? So what do we learn from the story of Zechariah? Two big things. Number one, hang on to your hope. God is coming. Hope is coming to the world. The baby in the manger is the beginning of the story of salvation. Literally, he is the spark that will save the entire world. Hope is coming. The baby in the manger welcomes the unprepared. Jesus opens his arms and welcomes those who have no hope. (laughs) I'm not prepared today because I gave up on the idea of a better tomorrow. Have you ever felt this way? I'm unprepared, I'm hopeless, and I'm I'm starting to give up. Maybe you look at the economy in this area, and you think about the mines and the jobs leaving, and you just feel exhausted when you think about the future of this area and what's coming, and how are we going to do this? Or maybe you're looking at the politics of this country, and the Democrats, and the Republicans, and how much they hate each other, and how angry and aggressive and awful they are to each other, and you just kind of want to walk away from the whole system. Maybe you're looking at your family, your marriage, your work, and you just, you don't see how it's ever going to get better. And so you start to give up hope today. It's okay to feel this way because it's real and it's raw. It's okay to sit in the darkness sometimes or sit in the silence like Zechariah because that is the moment when the light of God has the most power. God has the most power. Hang on to your hope. The baby in the manger, the Lord of all creation, turns to the hopeless of our world and he offers them a VIP ticket. He takes us in his arms and he whispers in our ears and he says, you need the message of Jesus Christ now more than ever. Let me tear down the curtain and step into your world. Let me into your world. Zechariah was not ready for his son, John the Baptist, to be born. But that's okay. Because John the Baptist, his whole life, his whole ministry was all about getting people ready for God. His whole ministry was all about telling people to give them a hope for a better tomorrow, to realize that the struggles of today do not get the last word. Let me say that again because that is really good news. The struggles of today do not get the last word. That is the promise of the baby in the manger. God is coming. Hope is coming to prepare the way of the Lord. Hang on to your hope. God is coming. Second, when you have hope, when when you've got a tight grip on the promise that God is coming, the second step is to prepare with expectation. God welcomes the unprepared. God welcomes those who don't have any hope. But he doesn't leave you that way. God prepares the unprepared. God reaches into our lives and gets us ready for something greater than the misery of today. So prepare with expectation. Remember those kids in Harlem. They were told, you can go to college if you could just get through high school. 
and 90% of them rose to the challenge because they had hope for something better. In a world where 50% drop out, and our promise from God is even better than going to college. If we could just make it through the next step, whatever obstacle is in front of you in your life, if you could just make it through this next step, God is coming. Prepare with expectation. Put your life together today with the expectation that God is going to show up and he's going to do great things in your world. It may not be the way you expect. It may not be when you expect, but God is coming. He's got a VIP ticket for you. Will you be ready for it? The the baby in the manger kind of changed everything, didn't it? It used to be so exclusive. One guy could go into this secret room once a year, and he had to do it in a special way like Zechariah. (laughs) It was so exclusive and intimidating. But then Jesus shows up in the manger just like, just there, in the world, available to everyone, ready or not. God welcomes the unprepared in each of us in those moments when we're not ready and we're stressed and we're overwhelmed and there's so much to do and we're starting to be hopeless and we're starting to give up. God sends a little reminder, the message of John the Baptist and his dad, Zechariah, something better is coming. God is coming in a whole new way. And so I'll leave you with this. How does your vision of tomorrow affect the way you're acting today? Do you believe that it's going to get better tomorrow? And then move past yourself. Are there people in your life, people around you who have no hope for a better future? And how is that affecting their life? What could you do to give them access to the hope that comes into our lives and the baby in the manger? The Christmas story gives us hope, welcomes the unprepared so that they could step into the presence of God, find that hope that they are missing, and then never be the same again. What could you do to show them hope? Amen.